Let's turn to John chapter 21. The further you go on in life, the more likely you are to have regrets. And maybe it's things that we did or didn't do before we became a Christian. And we look at those things and we are filled with uh, sadness and we wish we could turn back the hands of time and we could undo them. Or maybe it's things that we've done or left undone since we've come to Christ. And sometimes they can fill us with more regret. Or maybe it's things that we just look back and we wish that we could have done them differently. And sometimes we could even doubt whether God has forgiven us, whether God loves us, whether God has any use for us. And maybe there's things that trigger that regret. Maybe there's some fleeting echo of the past and regret washes over us again and you. And we know we can't undo the past, but we are filled with regret still. I wonder if Peter had triggers for his regret. I wonder what happened each morning when the cock crowed at break of day. I wonder what happened when he gazed into the embers of a a coal fire and was taken back in his mind's eye to that evening in the high priest's courtyard. And has that series of flashbacks, the little girl at the gate who said to him, you're not one of his followers, are you? The, the fire, the coal fire in the courtyard. The question, the second question, the third question. As he sees again in his mind's eye the glance from Jesus, that loving look over his shoulder at Peter. And then the cock crowing. And Peter needs his past dealt with, as we need our past dealt with. And there's three things I want us to see this morning. First of all, Jesus deals with Peter's past. Jesus deals with Peter's past. The scene is carefully set. It's filled with echoes of Peter's time with Jesus. Jesus has brought them to Galilee, to the lake where it all started. Their first meeting, as we read in Luke 5, was marked by a miraculous catch of fish. So is this one. At that time, Jesus called Peter to leave his nets and to come and follow him. And he does the same here. But there's more. In the midst of that, we read in verse 9, that when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. Now, we mightn't think anything of that, but there's a particular word used for this fire. It means a a charcoal fire. It's not a fire made with timbers uh, from driftwood uh, or from branches of trees. It was made from coals. And the only other time that's used is in John 18 to describe the fire in the high priest's courtyard. It's an echo. It's an echo of that night. And as they sit round that fire... On the the shoreline of the lake, Jesus asks Peter a question. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? More than these. That's another echo of that night. That night when, uh, before they went out to Gethsemane, in that upstairs room where they had the Lord's Supper, and Jesus said to the disciples, would run away. Peter said this, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Though they all fall. Now Jesus says, do you love me more than these? More than they do? More than they do. It brings back Peter's ghastly, hollow boast. It brings it right out into the open round the fireside, and and horror of horrors. Jesus puts the same question to Peter, not just once, but three times. It is relentless in its repetition. It echoes the three questions that Peter was asked round the fireside in the courtyard. And Jesus takes Peter back to that most shameful moment in his life 
Why is he doing it? It seems as if Jesus is rubbing salt into a raw wound. But he has a loving purpose. He is disinfecting what could become a putrefying sore. He has brought him back to where it all began in Galilee, so that the past could be faced and the past could be put to rest. And before the past can ever be put to rest, it has to be faced. We can't just sweep it under the rug. And so Jesus takes Peter to that night, retracing his steps. And he does it gently and he asks him a question. Do you love me more than these? And each time Peter answers the question, Jesus commissions him to serve him. He still has a use for Peter. And then he asks him it again. And he commissions him again. And when he asks him the third time, Peter grasps the significance. He's grieved that Jesus asks him the question the third time. And he says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And again, for the third time, Jesus recommissions Peter. And what Jesus is doing is dealing with Peter's past. The failure had been public and Jesus deals with him publicly so that the others could see and hear Jesus restoring him. And here's the wonder of what Jesus is like as our Savior. Here's the wonder of grace. Forgiveness is a gift that he gives no matter our sin. No matter how deeply wounding our sins are to him. We don't need to hide. We don't need to be destroyed by guilt or fear. We can say to him with Peter, Lord, you know everything. He knew Peter's failures, his lies, his swearing oaths that he had no connection to Jesus. Never mind that he was a disciple. Never mind that he loved him. Peter had sworn he didn't know him. But Jesus as well as knowing Peter's failures, knew his heart too. He knew the bitter regret. He knew the repentance. You know, I think it's true for all of us, the further you go on in the Christian life, the finer tuned our souls are to sin. Things that we wouldn't have regarded as sinful, we now regard as grievous. Things that people around us would say, you're being far too hard on yourself. And they might say to us, would you ever give yourself a break? And yet we know that these things are displeasing to Christ. We become more aware of it. It doesn't mean we're always conscious of our sin. Too often we can motor through days without acknowledging our faults. But we know what sin is increasingly. Very much in the opposite to a survey I read recently where readers of a magazine were asked to rank different sins and they were asked to uh, to rate them uh, as how serious they were and then they were asked to to keep a count of how many sins they committed per month or how many sins they committed and the average uh, according to this survey was 4.64 sins per month 4.64 sins per month Not per week, not per day, but per month. You know, I think if we get through an hour, got through 10 minutes, got through a minute, without committing 4.6 sins, we'd be doing immensely well. And we become more aware of our sin. And is there a place for hopeless sinners? Is there a place for hopeless Peters? Well, we say, Lord, you know everything. We said along with Peter, is there any human being you could say that of? You know everything. That they know even our ugliest, darkest temptations. They know our struggles. They know those horrible thoughts that we've had to face. They know everything, inside and out. And Jesus does. All of it. Every single, last, grotty, ghastly failure. 
every unutterable thought. And here is the wonder of grace. We have a saviour who knows everything about us. And he stands before us, not asking, what on earth did you do that for? But do you love me? He knows all about it. And instead of us having to ask him, do you love me? He simply asks us where our heart is. He has forgiveness for Peter. And he has forgiveness for you and for me. And he wanted Peter to know it. He wants Peter to know that the past was past. That each denial has tenderly washed clean. The wound cleansed. And when Satan comes to you and casts your past, uh, maybe even your recent past in front of you, and says, are you even a Christian? We can say, my Saviour knows everything. And he knows the worst about me. And he has washed me clean. He has let out all the, the septic pus of sin out of the wounds that I have caused in my life. We can say, Jesus knows it all. And he has forgiven me. And this is what Jesus does for Peter here. And for us, he deals with our past. In some ways, it's a true climax to John's gospel. It's the acid test of grace. If you look back in your Bibles to just the end of the previous chapter, there's a little summary paragraph that in some ways looks like the conclusion to John's gospel. And many writers describe it as that. But I don't think it really is the conclusion to John's gospel. I think this is the conclusion. It's more fitting John had started off in 1 John 1, or sorry, in John 1, 14, saying, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Is he full of grace and truth? You know, sometimes you... Uh, you, know, you get something and it says you, you've won a lifetime supply of such and such. And then you read the small print uh, and you haven't really got a lifetime supply. It's a lifetime supply based on the average use of average people. Um, or you've signed up for unlimited broadband. And then you read the small print and it says subject to fair usage. Well, is Jesus full of grace and truth? Is he abounding in grace? Or is it subject to fair usage? Is there small print in the terms of our salvation? Is there forgiveness for every sin committed, no matter how grievous, to Christ? Well, John had said at the start that he was full of grace. And in this wonderful conversation with Peter, we see that he is full of grace. There is more mercy in Jesus than there, in, than there is sin in us. Then there is more mercy in Jesus than there is sin in the entire history of the world. Every sinner could be forgiven for every sin they commit if they would come to Jesus. Sadly and tragically, not every sinner does come to Jesus. Some think they only commit 4.64 sins per month. If only they could see the awful reality of the thousands upon thousands of guilty records in God's record book that they will have to give an account for. And if only they could see that Jesus is abounding in love and his grace and forgiveness for every sin. And if that's you this morning, dear friend, come and put your trust in Christ. Come and seek forgiveness. Ask him to show you your guilt and to show you your forgiveness that could be yours in Christ. And if we've been struggling with regret, let us see clearly that Jesus deals with the past thoroughly and completely. Jesus deals with the past. Secondly, Jesus challenges Peter's heart. Do you love me? He asks him. He didn't ask do you know me? He doesn't ask, what are you going to do to make up for all this? He asks, do you love me? 
Maybe we find that hard because we're so used to thinking of love in romantic terms, but think of someone that you're not romantically connected with, but you love them, you care deeply for them, you delight in them, you're fascinated by them, all that they've done for you, all that they bring to your friendship. You, you love them deeply, you care for them. That's what Jesus is asking here of Peter and of us. That's what he's interested in. He, he doesn't ask what Peter is going to do. He's less interested in what we do for him than in our relationship to him. That's what he came for, our hearts. He doesn't need our hands. He doesn't need our tongues. He doesn't need our feet. Well, he doesn't need our hearts either, to be strictly accurate, but he wants our hearts because he came to bring us to God, to bring us into relationship with God, the greatest blessing we could have. So does he have your heart? Do you delight in him? This is a vital question for diagnosing and growing in the Christian life. We need to ask it. We need to ask it because it brings comfort and it brings challenge. It brings comfort as we've seen. It cuts through our failures. How little we know ourselves at times. And if there's something we're really struggling with and if doubt has hit us, we might wonder... We might second guess ourselves, am I really a Christian? Did I trust enough? Did I believe enough? Do, did I repent enough? And Jesus doesn't ask Peter that. Because how could Peter know the answer? He asks him, do you love me? And there's many things we mightn't know and many things we mightn't be able to explain and many depths of our hearts that we're puzzled by and grieved by. But we could know this, that we love Jesus. You know, in this last week I was visiting somebody coming near the end of their days and I asked them where, where they were spiritually. Were they ready as they came towards the end? And they, they gave me a message uh, and they, they wrote down and said, I keep talking with God and I love him dearly. And that said so much, as I thought over this passage, that they would write they loved him dearly. And then they said, thank you for telling me about what God has done for me. And how much he loves me. And there's evidence of a heart that's been changed. They delight, they love Jesus. And maybe we need to hear this question being asked of us, not first of all for challenge, but to cut through the, the maze of our hearts and to help us to clarify our relationship with Jesus. If we're filled with doubt, come back to this question, do I love him? Do I love him? And you know, there's something wonderful here. Jesus sees Peter and all his boasting and all his bravado and all his remorse and he sees past it. He sees in Peter's flawed heart a desire to live for and honour Jesus. You know, whenever one of the children gives us a little uh, drawing, maybe you parents uh, remember this, uh, maybe it's a recent memory for some, a little drawing and a message on it, and it's a stick figure and the, the colouring in goes over the lines and it's, it's not a great work of art, and actually, to be truthful, there's a few spelling mistakes and a few back-to-front letters. And it says, I love you, Baddy. Or it should say, I love you, Daddy. But you see past the mistakes and the scribbles. And you see the heart of the child. And you know they love you, despite the mistake. Or maybe it's like a picture I saw once on the internet of a car all scratched down the side with a screwdriver, scored and gouged and the paintwork ruined. But amidst the scrapes and the scores was that little phrase, I love you, Daddy. Doesn't that melt the heart of a parent, even though you want to, to be angry? Well, our Saviour sees our love for him. And what a Saviour we have. Even 
with our regrets and our failures. He sees our hearts. But it's a question too that challenges us. Do you love me? Do you love me? It comes to us perhaps if we've been growing cold in our love for Christ. It's easy in the Christian life to grow cold. That's the great danger. And Jesus asks the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation, or he challenges them about losing their first love. And so we need this maybe to wake us up, to remind us that Christianity isn't a transaction completed in the past. It's a relationship in the present. So here's a challenge for us in the present. Have we grown cold? Or are we growing in love for Christ, in delight in Christ? You know, a couple of uh, weeks ago at the men's study, we watched a biography of uh, John G. Payton, an incredible missionary to the cannibals in the South Sea Islands in the 1800s. What an, an amazing man, and yet we saw the secret of his bravery and all that he did wasn't that he was a man of great courage, he was a man of great relationship with Christ. And you know, we will do much for Christ in proportion to how much he means to us. We will do much for Christ in proportion to how much he means for us. And so as Jesus challenges Peter to look away from his own bravado, from his own courage, from his own flailing of a sword, from his own courage in walking into the courtyard where many of the other disciples ran away, Jesus says, look away from that. Look away from your own gifts and abilities. Do you love me? Do you love me? And that challenge comes to us afresh to fan the, the flames of our delight in Christ. How do we do that? Well, we can pray and ask him, help me to delight in you more. Help me to delight in you more. And we can pray, we can, we can pray, and we can think. We can think about Christ. One of the old Puritans said, think about what he has done for you. Think what he has suffered for you. Think what he has purchased for you. Think what he has promised to you. Think what he has laid out for you in your daily life, how he has mapped it all out, and think what he has laid up for you in heaven. Let me give you that again. Think what he has done for you. Think what he has suffered for you. Think what he has purchased for you. Think what he has promised to you. Think what he has laid out for you. Think what he has laid up for you. Here's how we can delight in Christ more. Pray and think. And, and Another suggestion, read. We can maybe make it our aim in this coming year to read a book on Christ and what he's done for us. If you want any recommendations, come, come and speak to me. Do you love me? Both a comfort and a challenge for the present. And then one final point. One final point as we, we finish. Jesus commissions Peter's future. Jesus commissions Peter's future. What does the future hold for Peter? Has he any usefulness? Or is he like, you know how you have a, a cup or a mug that you've got somewhere on holidays or somebody gave it to you and it's been chipped or cracked, but you don't want to throw it out. But it sits on the cupboard shelf and it gradually works its way to the back, neglected and nobody uses it. Is that all that's left for Peter? To be like that mug on the shelf. He's still there, not thrown out, but he's no use. Or maybe Peter feared that he would fail catastrophically again. Isn't that our great fear that we'll let Jesus down a bucketful? And Jesus has three things he says to Peter here. He has a word about his role. Feed my sheep. He entrusts to Peter his precious sheep, his little lambs. Peter's failure has not made him useless. Peter, 
or Jesus has an important task for him. And he has important work for you and for me to do. And as Peter's failure will equip him better to feed the sheep and to take care of the lambs, so our failures equip us better to feed and to take care of our fellow Christians. And so here's a role for us. We all have a use and a purpose in encouraging and spurring on our fellow believers, in feeding them and guarding them and praying for them, in nurturing them. And although this was initially given to Peter as an apostle, it has an application to us as we look out for Christ's little lambs, the little ones in our congregation, as we're an example to them and as we pray for them. And as we look out for our fellow sheep, as we seek to encourage them and pray for them, as we encourage them with God's word in the Bible study and in conversation and in messages, God is a role, even when we failed him. And God is a word about Peter's faithfulness, a word about his faithfulness. You know everything, Peter says to Jesus, and Jesus knows the future. He knows how Peter will die. I don't think many of us would want to know how we would die. But for Peter, it was going to be helpful to know. And Jesus tells Peter that when he is older, he'll be taken where he doesn't want to go and his hands will be stretched out. It's a reference to being crucified. And John tells us that this was an insight into how Peter would glorify Jesus by his death. He wasn't going to fail. He wasn't going to buckle at the end under pressure. Peter could have lived with an awful crippling fear that he would let Jesus down at the end. And Jesus says to him, No, Peter, you once boasted you would lay down your life for me, and actually you will. You'll be faithful to the end. Peter would finish well. And Jesus wanted him to know it. Well, Jesus doesn't give each of us that insight into our future. But Peter will only finish well because Jesus will keep him going to the end. He would shield him. And Peter knew it. In 1 Peter 1.5, he speaks about there's an inheritance kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power. Peter knew the shielding, and you can know that shielding, that God will keep you going to the end. Nothing can rip you out of his abundant grace. And then he's got a word about Peter's focus. A word about his role, a word about his faithfulness, and a word about his focus. Follow me. Follow me. That's where it all started. And Jesus gives him a fresh start after his failure. He says, just follow me. Follow me. Keep your eyes on me, follow me. Keep your eyes on me, love me, follow me. And that's what we're to do every day. Keep our eyes on Jesus, grow in love for him and follow him. And as we do that, he'll keep us going to the end, fueled by our love for him and enabled by his strength in us. John is nearly finished showing us Jesus and what a portrait of our Saviour he's shown us, full and overflowing with grace and truth, just like he'd said in the first chapter. So let us draw near with all our faults to find cleansing and restoration and refueling for living the Christian life, for following Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you for Jesus. What a saviour we have. What amazing grace there is. We thank you that there is more mercy in Christ than there is sin in us. We thank you that his abundant, unlimited grace is not subject to fair usage or subject to an average amount of sins committed in the average lifetime. And if we exceed the average, somehow there is no extra forgiveness. Thank you that he is not like the so-called generous offers that are touted uh, on advertising hoardings. Thank you that he is abounding in grace. And so, Father, help us to be amazed. 
Help us to be thrilled. Help us to be fueled with delight in Christ. And where we have perhaps grown dim in our love for Christ, amaze us more. Thrill us more. Fill us with delight at what he's done for us, what he's doing for us, what he has laid up for us. Help us to pray and to think and to meditate on Christ so that we will do great things for him. As we seek to live for him in this, in this world and in this coming year, we ask it for Jesus' sake and for Jesus' glory. Amen.